and all this information is derived directly from their website. So the NCLEX exam, it's not broken down by body systems. It's not 20% cardiology, 10% respiratory. No, it's broken down by client needs. So we have four major client needs categories, safe and effective care environment that has two subcategories, management of care and safety and infection control, which is what we're gonna be talking about today, health promotion and maintenance, psychosocial integrity, and then physiological integrity, which has four subcategories. So basic care and comfort, pharmacological and parental therapies, reduction of risk, and physiological adaptation. And so as you can see, uh, the left-hand side of the screen is a table graph. The right-hand side of the screen is a pie graph. The right-hand side of the screen tells you uh, is a more colorful depiction of those outlines. You can see management of care has about 18% here, uh, while you can see some of the smaller categories like basic care and comfort and psychosocial integrity, about 9% for these same with health promotion and maintenance, but that doesn't mean that they're any less important. They are just as important as your larger categories. It just means there's fewer questions that come from there. But that 9% of questions, if you get them wrong, could end up determining a pass or a fail result for you. So please make sure that you're taking all of these categories um, seriously and not just uh, focusing on the ones that are larger in content. So what does safe and effective care environment mean? When you're looking at it and you're like, well, management of care is 15 to 21%. Safety and infection control is 10 to 16%. What does that mean for me? What kind of topics are derived from these two subcategories? Well, management of care are things such as advanced directives, advocacy, assignment, delegation, supervision, concepts of management, case management, client rights. So when you're looking at that percentage, it's coming from these topics. Same with safety and infection control. You've got topics such as accident and injury prevention, emergency response, ergonomic principles, use of equipment, use of restraint safety devices, and home safety, uh, just to name a few. So when you're looking and you're thinking, oh my goodness, well, I'm studying from a body system perspective, how does that translate into client needs categories? These are those subtopics. So let's get into some testing strategies. So when you were enrolled in the program, everybody was given access to a Learn Upon account. Your Learn Upon account is like our online library here at Avant. It's where we uh, store all of those pre recorded modules for you. So we've got all the different body systems in there, we've got um, just some different coaching strategies, webinars in there for you. One of the webinars is entitled The Six Steps to Question Success. This webinar is very important for you to listen to and for you to understand because it's how we teach you to approach a question from a strategic point of view. The very first step in the six steps to question success is to say, well, what is our focus? What's our approach going to be? What is the type of NCLEX question here? So what's the focus? What is it that the test question creator wants to know from me. Do they want to know if I can delegate? Do they want to know if I can prioritize something? Do they want to know if I understand how to communicate therapeutically? Or maybe they want to know if I understand the pathophysiology of a disease process, or if I can teach, or if I can educate, make a plan of care surrounding a specific diagnosis. So what's the focus of the question? What's your approach? Is there a strategy that you can implement here? Can you do an apples and oranges? Can you do an umbrella option? Or is this a fixed versus flexible? And if you're new to the program and you're thinking, why is she talking about apples and oranges? We're talking about NCLEX questions here. Again, I'm gonna refer you to your Learn Upon account because there are strategies that we teach you to use for certain types of questions. So go back to your Learn Upon account, listen to the webinars that talk about apples and oranges and umbrella options. Fixed versus flexible. So one thing to point out, guys, there's no absolutes in healthcare, but there are absolutes in nursing practice. 
what do I mean and what's the difference? There are no absolutes in healthcare, meaning that if you come across statements that say this patient is always going to have cancer or this client will always react to this medication, that's what we mean by fixed. There are no such things as fixed words in healthcare. It's all flexible, right? Because there's no absolutes. But there are absolutes in nursing practice. Nurses must wash their hands. Nurses must use a sterile technique when changing a central line dressing. So yes, there are absolutes in nursing practice, but there are not absolutes when it comes to healthcare. So keep that in mind. And then you've got to ask yourself, well, what's the style of the question I'm dealing with here? Is it a select all that apply? Maybe it's one of those new highlighting items. Maybe it's a type of drag and drop or a matrix grid. And again, if you're thinking, oh, I don't know what any of this means, go to your Learn Upon account. In one of the introduction webinars, we talk all about the different style types of questions. So become familiar with the exam. Knowledge is power. The more that you know about this exam, the better off that you're going to be. So therapeutic communication. All right, so when we talk about therapeutic communication, we do this in every single one of our question clinics, every week, Monday through Thursday. Why? Because it's important that you understand how to therapeutically communicate with your client. And this is not just on the NCLEX exam, but it's as a nurse at the bedside here in the United States. You've got to be able to read the room. You've got to be able to respond in an appropriate manner. So, some tips and tricks that we teach you to respond with feelings and tone, to provide your clients with information, with evidence-based practice, data. What does the research show? Not your opinion. Focus on the client, right? Stay focused on what's happening with them and their situation. People don't want to hear you talk about your situation. You need to stay focused on what's happening with them. So you don't want to say things like, well, my grandma was diagnosed with cancer, so my family did this. Or when I was pregnant, I did this, so you should do that too. We don't want to press that upon anyone else. So stay focused on your client and what's happening with them. Use silence and presence. Silence and presence is so powerful. Okay? If you can give your client the opportunity to be present, but also give them a moment of silence to be able to digest the information that they've been given, that speaks volumes in building a trusting, working client relationship. We don't ask why questions, okay? Why questions could come across as being probing, and we don't want to do that. Well, why didn't you take your medication? Why didn't you go to that follow-up appointment? Okay. Um, however, you know, there's a caveat to this because at some point in your relationship building with this client, you may reach the point in which it is okay to ask a why question if you have developed that rapport. But in beginning a relationship with a client, a healthy work relationship with them, you want to make sure that we refrain from judgment and asking why. Okay. Don't ask yes or no questions, except in the case of possible self-harm. So the only time that it is really okay to ask a yes or a no question is if your client is possibly suicidal, okay, uh, could cause harm to themselves or harm to someone else. Other than that, when it comes to NCLEX questions, you really should be choosing the answer options that are open-ended because open-ended Answer options and just open-ended questions in general allow your client to divulge information to you should they choose to. It allows for further relationship building. Don't explore, again, um, this goes back to asking why questions. Exploring could come across as being probing. It could come across as being judgmental. So definitely refrain away from those types of, of answer options, okay? And then don't say don't worry because we don't know what's going to happen in the future, right? We don't want to give our clients a sense of false hope and say, oh, don't worry, you'll beat this. Don't worry, it'll be okay. Don't worry, your labs will look better tomorrow. We want to refrain from saying those sorts of things to our clients. 
All right, so the six step strategy to question success like we talked about, um, this is in depth guys on your webinar on learn upon, make sure you're listening to it, but this is just sort of a overview, quick, quick, quick overview of what the six steps to question success is. So uh, step one, determine the type of question. So like we talked about, we got to say, well, what's the focus of the question? Are there any strategies we can use? And what's the type of question here? Step two is identifying the topic, okay? We are identifying our topic as it relates to the instruction of the question. So important that you are identifying your topic correctly. We identify the topic based off the instruction of the question, not based off the story of the question. Step three, look for keywords or clues. Okay, are there any keywords here in this question that will help me with my topic? Step four, applying your knowledge. What do you know about this topic? What do you know about this diagnosis? Is it expected or is it unexpected? Can you apply any of your strategies here? Step five, review and eliminate. Can you begin a process of elimination? Are there any of these answer options that you can go ahead and quickly eliminate? And step six, reread the question with the answer you've chosen to make sure it actually makes sense. Are you answering the question that is being asked of you? All right, so before we head into question number one, I do have someone in the chat box, if you can hear me. Um, they say that they're trying to log in, but you are logged in. This is the class that we're, we're talking about. So everyone, rest assured, has been allowed into the meeting who is uh, trying to get in. So I don't have anybody waiting in, in the lobby. So if somebody is saying they are trying to get in, you are here and you are in. So. Let's go ahead and do question number one together. All right, and for those of you joining us, I just want to reiterate how Question Clinic is going to go for the next 10 questions. I'm going to read the question aloud. I'm going to read the answer options aloud. I'm going to give you two minutes, so I'm going to go on mute and be silent. Put your answer into the chat box. I will be reviewing as they come in. After two minutes is up, I will come back together. Uh, we will come back together. I will reveal the correct answer to you. We will not be going back. Okay, so please make sure you are paying close attention as we progress through the question. So question number one, here we go. The nurse provides care for four assigned clients. Using knowledge in of pathophysiology, which client will the nurse assess first? Is it number one, the client admitted with a broken hip who's in traction and reports pain? Number two, the client who is diagnosed with a stroke and needs to be fed breakfast. Number three, the client who is a quadriplegic and is due to be turned and repositioned. Or number four, the client admitted with anaphylaxis who begins sudden forceful coughing. So let me put two minutes on my timer, guys, and here we go.
Alrighty, guys, so coming back together, let me reveal the correct answer to you. And the correct answer, who should the nurse see first? It's going to be number four. A client admitted with anaphylaxis who begins sudden forceful coughing. When a client is admitted with anaphylaxis, the nurse is aware that there is a risk of compromised airway. Sudden forceful coughing occurs when the body is attempting to keep an airway open. The nurse should plan to see this client first. But I did have some of you who put one, two, or three, so let's talk about why we wouldn't see these people first. Because these are expected findings. Number four is the one with an unexpected finding, okay? One, two, and three, these are all things that we would expect, okay? And they're all stable in regards to their diagnosis. So number one, a client admitted with a broken hip who's in traction and reports pain. A nurse is aware that a client in traction for a broken hip will experience pain. It is important that pain be addressed However, pain is considered psychosocial by Maslow's. Pain management can be delayed in order to care for a client with an airway risk. Number two, a client who is diagnosed with a stroke and needs to be fed breakfast. Clients who experience a stroke may have difficulty with swallowing and are at risk for choking or aspiration. The nurse is responsible for feeding this client due to these associated risks. The nurse understands that Maslow places food at the first level. However, a client's needs can be delayed but still met. And number three, a client who's a quadriplegic and is due to be turned and repositioned. The nurse is also aware that the client with quadriplegic, quadriplegia is at risk for skin breakdown if not turned on a regular schedule. However, if the client on the clients listed above, this is not the client the nurse would see first. So for those of you who chose number four, you are indeed correct. All right, excellent job, guys. And again, like I said before, you run into any issues with being able to see the screen or to hear, please go ahead and log out and then log back in. All right, guys, excellent job with question number one. Let's do question number two. The emergency room nurse is handing off report to the nurse in the intensive care unit about a patient who was intubated about 45 minutes ago, post cardiac arrest. Which is the most effective way to assure essential information about the client is reported? Number one, give report face-to-face -face with both the nurses in a quiet room. Number two, call the nurse on a recorded line for the report for future reference and documentation. Three, use a printed checklist with information individualized for the client. Or four, document essential transfer information in the client's medical record. Which of these is the most effective way to assure essential information about a client is reported? Two minutes on the clock. Here we go.
All righty, guys. So coming back together, let me reveal the correct answer. We had answers all over the board here. Some number one, some two, some three, and some four. So let's talk about this. Number three is the correct answer here, guys. Use a printed checklist with information individualized for the client. Why? Using an individualized printed checklist ensures that all key information is reported. The checklist can then serve as a record to which nurses can refer to later. This choice best applies to the stem of the question. For the safety of the patient to maintain safe continuity of care, organized with a well-constructed systematic report assures that the detailed and essential information is clearly provided in a timely manner, especially in critical situations. So this number three is indeed the correct answer here. But let's talk about the others because some of you guys did put one, two, and four. Number one, give a report face-to-face -face with both nurses in a quiet room. Although face-to-face -face report in a quiet room sounds conductive, conducive, sorry, Verbal report leaves room for error in memory, right? Number two, call the nurse on a recorded line for the report for future reference and documentation. Calling the nurse on a recorded line requires nurses to spend unnecessary time retrieving information. And number four, documentation. Uh, document essential transfer information in the client's medical record. Documentation in the client's medical record requires nurses to spend unnecessary time retrieving information as well. So number three is indeed the correct answer. Um, I have people, if you can hear me in the chat box, you're, you're asking to be let back in to the class, but I have let everyone into the class. So if you can hear me, there is no one in the waiting room. So you should be able to access the class, hear my voice and see my screen. There is no one currently in my waiting room because I'm looking at it right now. So you are here, you're in the class. Okay. All right. And Elijah, you have just put about seven different threes in my chat box. Just wanted to point that out. All right, let's move on to question number three. Which statement made by the client currently undergoing remission induction therapy for treatment of acute myeloid leukemia demonstrates that teaching is necessary? Number one, I'm going to miss not being able to spend time with my cat at this time. Number two, I will be sure my dentist, I will be sure to see my dentist this week for a deep cleaning to prevent any infection. Number three, I must report a temperature of 100 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. Do note that here in the United States, we use Fahrenheit. Okay? I know a lot of you all use Celsius, but please make sure that you um, understand how to convert. And number four, it is important for me to take breaks during my periods of activity. Which of these statements demonstrates that teaching is necessary? Two minutes on the clock here, guys. Here we go.
Alrighty, guys. So coming back together, let me reveal the correct answer to you. And number two is indeed the correct answer. I will be sure to see my dentist this week for a deep cleaning to prevent any infection. Oral hygiene will have to be provided by using a warm staling gargle instead of brushing the teeth and gums. So guys, we were looking for the answer that was wrong. This is a negative query. So we're looking for the statement that said that's wrong. Okay. Um, the best time for dental hygiene assessment for a cancer patient or a cancer client is before cancer therapy begins. In most circumstances, ideally a month before chemo begins. The dental hygienist should also ensure identification and elimination of sources of oral trauma and irritation, such as orthodontic bands, ill-fitting dentures, and other oral appliances. In order to allow for healing, oral, surgical, or invasive procedures should ideally be performed at least seven to 10 days before the myelosuppressive therapy begins. Alrighty, so number two, this is a statement that is incorrect and means that the client needs more teaching, which means number one, number three, and number four are all correct. So number one, I'm going to miss not being able to spend time with my cat. Contact with animals must be avoided because they carry infection and the induction therapy will destroy the client's WBCs. Number three, I must report a temperature of 100 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. This is correct. The client is at risk for infection, especially due to the decrease in white blood cell production and should report a temperature of 100 degrees Fahrenheit or more. And number four is also correct. It is important for me to take breaks during my periods of activity. Induction therapy will cause anemia, causing the patient to experience fatigue and they'll have to pace activities with rest periods. So for those of you who put number two, you are indeed correct. Okay. All righty. And I have a question in the chat box. It says, how long after chemo can a patient see a dentist for deep cleaning? I would say that that is all going to be contingent on how well you, the client uh, handles the chemo. Some clients handle chemo very well with little side effects and also depending on what type of chemo they're getting. Um, while some um, really do struggle and have a lot of side effects. So it would be dependent on each person. All right, good question. All right, question number four. Which statement is true regarding legality? Number one, during a clinical class setting, a student nurse cannot be sued for malpractice. Number two, a nurse on duty is abandoning her patients if she becomes ill and goes home after notifying her supervisor. Number three, a 14 year old can give consent for medical treatment of a disease sexual intercourse. And number four, abortion in the second trimester may be obtained without state involvement. So two minutes on the clock here and go.
Alrighty, guys. So coming back together, this is a hard one, and I don't know that I like this question particularly. Um, first off, the correct answer is number three, which a lot of you guys did put number three, and that's great. Let me read through the rationale as to why that this one is correct, and then I'll give my um, my thoughts on the other ones. So a 14 year old can give consent for medical treatment of a disease transmitted during sexual intercourse. The HIPAA privacy rule allows for treatment of an STD infection without parental consent. The client is advised to contact sexual partners, but is not required to give names. In many states, no age is specified. In some, the age is 12, others, 14, at which permission from parents is not needed for sexually transmitted um, infection treatment, STI treatment, okay? Based upon current privacy laws, a minor is considered the individual who can consent for STD treatment, and this is found on the cdc.gov slash HIV slash policies slash law slash state slash minor. So uh, we do have a source for where this comes from. However, um, in talking about some of the other ones, number four, please be aware that the abortion laws are changing here in the United States and each state uh, also has representation with the laws. And so a lot of that has been changing in the past couple months to a year or so. I don't particularly love this question. I feel like it is very debatable. Uh, so with that, we are going to move forward. But number three would indeed be true regarding legality. And we do have a source um, to back that up. So with that being said, we're going to move right along to question number five. Question number five says, a nurse administers digoxin to a three-pound neonate and the infant experiences permanent heart and brain damage because the adult dose was given. The nurse may be charged with number one, tort, number two, assault, Number three, negligence, or number four, malpractice. Two minutes on the clock, here we go. Alrighty, guys, so coming back together, the correct answer here is indeed number four, which most of you got right. Um, the nurse may be charged with malpractice. The nurse could be charged with malpractice, which is failing to perform or performing an act that causes harm to the client. Giving the infant an overdose, even if accidental, is considered malpractice. Now, one, two, and three, let's talk about why those are incorrect. Number one is tort. Tort is a wrongful act committed on the patient or the patient's belongings. Two, an assault is a violent physical or verbal attack. And three, negligence is failing to perform the proper standard of care for a patient. So number four would be the correct answer.
All right, so let's move into our case scenario of the day. So, so to simulate questions like those found on the NCLEX exam, we have created case studies like you would see in the real world. These cases reflect the kinds of critical decisions nurses have to make in a variety of healthcare settings. So on the NCLEX exam, everyone will be given three case scenarios to work through. Each case scenario has six questions. So 18 of your questions will come from case studies. It is important that you know how to work through a case study. Now, you may hear um, from friends or, or colleagues who've taken the NCLEX exam, there are unscored items on NCLEX that go towards the future development of other tests. So some people may end up getting five case studies, but out of those, only three are indeed going to be scored, and only three of those results are actually going to go towards your uh, result of a pass or a fail. So case scenarios, one of the important things to point out, Nurse Achieve has over 145 case scenarios for you to practice. So I highly recommend that you are incorporating self-generated case studies in your daily study um, and in your daily work. So make sure that you understand how to work through these cases together. All right. And that's what we're going to do today. So what did we do? We integrated the nursing process and the clinical judgment model. So at the NCSBN, they created this clinical judgment measurement model as a framework designed for testing because it does complement the nursing process and other evidence-based nursing theories. So these questions, guys, are going to reflect real-world nursing care uh, because we're using realistic scenarios or case studies like we would typically see in a nurse-client interaction. So what does this mean? Well, we all know the nursing process. The nursing process is something that you learn in nursing school. That has not changed. What we are doing is we're now integrating clinical judgment because it's important that we can demonstrate critical thinking ability. So the first step in the nursing process is to do an assessment. With clinical judgment model, this says I'm going to recognize clues and I'm going to say, well, what matters most to my client in this situation? The next part of the nursing process is a diagnose. This is steps two and three of the clinical judgment model. This is where we're analyzing clues and where we are prioritizing hypotheses. So we're saying, well, what does it mean? And well, where do I start? Next, we're making a plan. So step four, we're generating solutions. We're saying, well, what can I do? Next, we're implementing. Step five, we're taking action. So we're saying, what will I do? And last but not least, we're evaluating. So we are evaluating the outcomes and saying, did this help? Now, a lot of times, if you're working in the hospital setting, you don't necessarily know the outcome of your client, right? We, we do the diagnosis, we do the plan, we implement the teaching, and we send them out, we discharge them. So we don't always know what that outcome is, but it is part of our nursing process. So it's important to understand that it's there. So let's read through the case scenario together. So pardon me while I read through all of these words on the screen. So the case study for the day. AR is a 74-year-old male brought to the ED after falling from a 10-foot ladder at his home. He complains of headache, right arm pain, right hip pain, and noticeable right frontal swelling and bleeding from the lips. Accompanied by his wife, who drove her husband in her car, physical exam findings are as follows. So vital signs, 99.0 degrees Fahrenheit for temperature. Heart rate is 112. Respirations are 16. Blood pressure is 184 over 90. And O2 is 96% on room air. General appearance, he's 5 foot 9, weighs 175 pounds. His right elbow is edema with bruising. Neuro, neuro assessment. He's lethargic, but oriented times four. Perla, face symmetrical, tongue midline, and moves all extremities. Cardiovascular assessment, regular rhythm, no murmurs or gallops. Pulmonary assessment, lung sounds clear on auscultation. 
abdomen, soft, normal bowel sounds, and social assessment. He's a non-smoker, non-alcoholic, and no known um, allergies, no known drug allergies. All right, so question six says, click to highlight which cues in the case study indicate concern. So the case study on the left-hand side of the screen is exactly what I just read to you. So on the NCLEX exam, what you would do is you would drag to highlight the words or phrases that you feel indicate concern. Because you do not have the opportunity to highlight, please go ahead and type in the words or phrases that you feel indicate concern. Please also try to type them all in one chat box so I can read them together versus just throwing random words out there because it's hard for me to keep up. There's 182, and if you are all just doing one-liners, it makes it difficult for me to read through. So put everything in one box, and when you're ready to submit, then go ahead and hit enter. All right, so here we go. Two minutes on the clock. All righty, guys, so coming back together, let's go ahead and reveal these. So we've got a 74-year-old male. Patient's age, advanced age, is more susceptible to serious bone injury or bone loss at higher risk for fractures and healing. The fall from a 10-foot ladder indicates serious injury. Three, complaints of a headache. Right arm pain, right hip pain, and noticeable right frontal swelling and bleeding from the limps, lips. This indicates a type of injury. Blood pressure. Elevated blood pressure can be related to pain, but deserves some attention. The frontal swelling, sorry, I forgot to uh, mention that one, is concerning as it indicates head trauma. Elbow edema may be present as a fracture or a clot. And lethargy is also something that we would be concerned about. All right, question seven. So let's read the case study together. AR is a 74-year-old male brought to the ED after falling from a 10-foot ladder at his home. He complains of headache, right arm pain, right hip pain, and noticeable right frontal swelling and bleeding from the lips, accompanied by his wife who drove her car, drove her in the car. Past medical history includes Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, five years ago, currently in remission, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and no known uh, drug allergies. Diagnostic results. So the CT of the head came back, negative for bleed or hematoma. X-ray of the right elbow does show a fracture. And X-ray of the right hip shows no fracture. Medications include 
IV 0.9% normal saline KVO, which just stands for keep the vein open. Morphine sulfate, two milligrams IV as needed for severe pain. And the physician has ordered a CT scan of the head and pelvis, X-ray of the right arm, labs, a CMP, a CBC with diff, and admit to the ICU for observation. Seven is a drag and drop. List the top five nursing priorities when caring for a patient with a fracture. Drag options from the selection box to complete the list below. So we have down here eight different selections, five of which you need to choose. It does not matter the order. So what would we be, what would we prioritize when taking care of a client with a fracture? Diarrhea, prepare for rehab and PT, maintain a sepsis, exhibit no evidence of complications, relief of pain, stabilize and maintain limb alignment, maintain vital signs with normal range, and order the appropriate sling. So I know it's going to be a lot to type out. I do apologize, but go ahead and try to put them all in one chat box for me. Okay, two minutes on the clock here, guys. Five of the top nursing priorities for a client with a fracture. Here we go. All righty, so let me go ahead and reveal the correct answers to you. Relief of pain, stabilize and maintain limb alignment, maintain asepsis, maintain vital signs within normal range, and exhibit no evidence of complications. These would be the top five nursing priorities when caring for a patient with a fracture. Now, it doesn't mean that the others are not important. They would be important, but these would be uh, our nursing priorities when dealing with a client with a fracture here. I did notice someone in the chat just gave me a bunch of numbers and I didn't know what that meant. You put like three, four, five, and six or something, but I didn't know what, what order you went or how you did it. So anywho, all right, let's keep going. Question eight. So let's see, we have case study that has progressed. So under our case study over here on the left-hand side, five days post-op, the client is recovering from elbow surgery. Pain level reported three out of 10 and vital signs are stable. We have some physician discharge orders. So resume home meds, follow up with the surgeon in two weeks, follow post-op instructions and outpatient rehab three times a week. Question eight says the nurse is preparing to discharge the patient. Click to specify what information should be included in the discharge instructions. Select all that apply. All right, number one, keep the dressing or splint on until your first post-op appointment. Two, resume activities and driving with precaution. Three, may shower with a bag 
over affected area. Four, report any signs or symptoms of infection, including a fever over 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Five, call 911 if you have sudden headache, dizziness, nausea, or vomiting. And six, drink plenty of fluids. So I'm going to give you guys two minutes on the clock. And this time, yes, you can use numbers because they, they are labeled. So go ahead and tell me what would be appropriate. This is a select all that apply question. So two minutes on the clock, and then I'll reveal the correct answers. Here we go. Alrighty, guys, so coming back together, let me reveal which ones are appropriate. So number one, four, five, and six. I do see some of you put in here all except number two, but I do want to talk to you about why number three. So let's talk about number one. Keep the dressing splint on until your first post-op appointment. That is indeed true. The splint is not removable and serves the purpose of protecting the fracture. Number two, let's talk about why two and three are not correct. So no driving for six to eight weeks after surgery. Avoid pushing, pulling, or anything heavier, heavier than a pencil. Okay. And then three is incorrect. May shower with a bag over the affected area. Do not submerge or wet the affected area until the sutures are removed approximately two weeks later. Then you may shower protecting the site with a plastic bag. So that that site should we should teach our clients that that site should not get wet at all. OK, even just putting a bag over it. Evidence based practice shows that we should teach that that area should not be wet at all, period. Bag over it, not a bag over it. It shouldn't get wet. So we would want to teach that the affected areas uh, are not getting wet in any way, shape, or form until the sutures are removed approximately two weeks later. And then four, five, and six are all correct. Okay, we would want to teach them to report any signs or symptoms of infection. Call 911 with sudden onset of headache or dizziness or nausea, vomiting, and drink plenty of fluids. Number nine, so our case study has evolved. So two weeks after discharge, AR has fallen four times for weakness, and the wife reports he is easily agitated. The MD instructs the wife to call 911. AR arrives to the ED and is immediately placed on telemetry. While the nurse is taking vital signs, the patient starts seizing, presenting tonic-clonic movements. The nurse supports the airway and calls for help. Post-seizure, he is ill-appearing. Comatose, not communicating or following commands. Perla, cough, gag, reflex intact. Decerebrate posturing. Cardiac, he's tachycardic. Regular rhythm, no murmurs, rubs, or gallops. Pulmonary, no wheezing or rails noted. GI, abdomen is soft. Bowel sounds are present in all four quadrants. Temperature is 99 degrees Fahrenheit. Heart rate's 120. Respirations are 10. 
blood pressure is 190 over 110, and O2 is 80%, 86% on room air. The physician has ordered for a non-contrast CT, labs, CBC with diff, PTINR, PTT, troponin, and a BMP. Question number nine says, select one nursing intervention for each body system below that would be appropriate for the care of the client at this time. So neurology, Ativan four milligrams IV piggyback or IV push, Pepra 60 mg per kg or morphine five milligrams IV push. What do you guys think? You could just put a one, a two or a three. I'll give you 30 seconds. What are we doing for neuro? Ativan, Kepra, or morphine? All right, so I don't know that I necessarily agree with this response because it does tell us over here on the left-hand side, uh, post-seizure, which tells me that we are now in the post-ictal period. Um, and Ativan, Ativan is appropriate to stop the seizures, okay? If the seizures do not terminate, then we consider anti-seizure meds like Keppra uh, or Valproate, something like that. Morphine is definitely not appropriate, but the seizure has already stopped. Drug of choice is Ativan. So um, Ativan is what stops the seizures, but if the seizure has already stopped, would we necessarily want to give Ativan? All right, pulmonary. Pulmonary, obtain ABGs, open and protect the airway, prepare to intubate. 30 seconds. All right, for pulmonary, we are going to prepare to intubate. So think ABCs. Airway comes first. Open the airway and avoid aspiration. If seizures continue or the O2 continues to fall, consider the ABGs. The patient is experiencing decerebrate posturing that affects the respiratory center and need to prepare to intubate the patient and support their breathing. And last but not least, it's going to be cardiac. Are we obtaining a 12 lead ECG? Are we initiating an IV with a 16 to 18 gauge needle or preparing the MD to place a pulmonary arterial catheter, also called a PAC? 30 seconds. Alrighty, and this is initiate IV with 16 or 18 gauge needle. Why? We've got to establish um, a, an, a way to do fluids and medication. A 12 lead may be done, but it's not the priority over establishing IV access. And placing a pulmonary arterial catheter, also known as a swan's gons, is a good way to monitor hemodynamics, but not the priority at this time. Ooh, it's a little tricky. A little controversial there. All right, so on the left-hand side of the screen, the uh, information has not changed at this time. Question says, question 10 says, AR is diagnosed with a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Select from the drop-down menus dem below to demonstrate appropriate nursing care. So actions to take, administer uh, nipotine, nimodipine as ordered, prepare for an angiogram, administer aspirin, or prepare for a lumbar puncture. 
30 seconds on the clock. Which action are we taking here? And you could just put one, two, three, or four. All right, so it is going to be administer nemotapine as ordered. Okay, um, initially the bleeding must be controlled and lower the blood pressure to prevent ICP. That's our goal. Um, nemotapine is a calcium channel blocker and can reduce the blood pressure and prevent spasms. So that is why we would go ahead and give that one. And the parameters to monitor, give two to three liters of O2 nasal cannula. Report your output of less than 200 mLs uh, per hour or greater than 200 mLs per hour, less than. Monitor blood pressure frequently or monitor extra vent drain, EVP. And the correct answer here is monitor blood pressures frequently. Vasospasm is a complication of brain bleeds and causes the small vessels in the brain to spasm and can cause a stroke. Carefully monitor and treat the blood pressure. This is essential. Once the bleed is under control, a transcranial Doppler or a TCD is used to monitor the vasospasms. This non-invasive method measures vessel diameter and flow velocity. Elevated TCD levels um, greater than 120 can reduce the blood flow to the brain tissue and lead to stroke. The treatment is to maintain a high blood pressure to force blood into the vessels. Vasopressors may be given to maintain a blood pressure of 160 or greater. So we got to monitor that blood pressure. We need it to be like right there at a sweet spot, not too high, but not too low. All righty, guys. So yeah, that was a that was a, a, a pretty complicated case study there. Uh, lots of things that we could kind of talk about, debate about. Uh, would be interesting if we were kind of all in the room and had the opportunity to to talk through that more. But. Um, thanks for coming, guys. Thank you for, for being here today. If you would like to attend Question Clinic throughout the rest of the week, we do have offerings this afternoon, as well as on Tuesday. Wednesday and Thursday. So we would love for you to come back if you want to review the case study again. Just kind of you need to hear it again, understand it again. You're more than welcome to attend another class. But thank you for coming. I hope you learned at least one thing today. Uh, for those of you new to the program, I hope that you were able to see what some of the different question types look like and how to walk through a case study. One thing to point out, you can't go back on a case study. So you have to keep moving forward. So what I have testers tell me is that when they get to question three in a case study, they're all of a sudden like, oh man, I, I, I knew what the first question's talking about now. Unfortunately, you can't go back. So anyways, just wanted to give you guys that little piece of advice, but thank you so much for coming. I appreciate each and every one of you. If you have any direct questions that you would like to ask me, send me an email, mroden at avanthealthcare.com. I would love to be able to answer those specific questions that you might have. So thank you for coming. And again, take care. Have a good rest of your day.